Hey folks, Dr. Michael Chantel here for Renaissance Periodization, Chapter 2 of the RP Diet Book 2.0, linked below. Here's the big summary, implications, take home points. If you want any more detail, because we're going to be razzing through these videos here, it's just it's designed to be short. If you want any more detail, any super in-depth explanation, we have all of it, I promise. Fully cited references, you know, multiple dozens of page chapters on every single one of these videos. So if you want more, the buy link for the book is right below the video. Now, let's get into the quick summary. First of all, calorie balance. What is a calorie? Technically speaking, calorie is the amount of energy it takes to heat so a gram of water one degree Celsius between 14.5 and 15.5 degrees Celsius, right, in, uh, in uh, you know, normal pressure environment. So it's very technically defined in physics, but that means it's a unit of energy. So you don't really eat calories, but all the food you eat can generate a certain amount of energy, and that energy can also be stored as body fat and various other substrates. So calories are a unit of energy, and that's very important, and that means they affect a whole lot. First of all, super obvious point, how many calories you're eating per unit of time, we'll talk about per day a lot, is going to give you or not give you a certain amount of energy for performance. Your body can absolutely break down its own tissues to get you to perform. But when your body breaks down its own tissues, particularly muscle and fat, to get you to perform in sport at a certain level, it's kind of like a last resort and it's more fight or flight. And it doesn't give you nearly as much energy as is ideal. It's certainly nothing you want to rely on in sport competition. Yeah, if there's a bear chasing you and you've been starving in the woods for a while, you'll get enough energy to run away from the bear. But if you want your best absolute performance, you've got to eat enough calories to supply that energy externally from the food you're eating to your working muscles. And if you eat too few calories, your energy levels are going to stink. If you eat just the right amount of calories or even more, your energy levels are going to be sufficient to get you to where you need to go. Now, if you eat too many calories, specifically from certain kinds of macronutrients, fat being the number one, carbs being a close second, and proteins up for debate, but if you eat more protein that stops fat loss in other ways, so on and so forth, main point being, if you eat too many calories, usually your fat stores go up. If you eat too few calories, you'll have to burn your own fat stores and possibly some muscle for energy. So weight gain and weight loss is actually entirely accounted for by calorie balance. The difference between how many calories you burn day to day and how many you eat. So if you burn more calories than you eat, you will lose tissue, which will reflect itself on the scale. So tissue loss, how big your body actually is, We'll get to measuring and tracking in later chapters. Sometimes that's not entirely reflected by your weight. Over long term, it sure is. <coughs> if you undereat calories, you will lose tissue every single time. If you overeat calories, you will gain tissue every single time. That has a really, really big implication for some stuff uh, that we're going to be trying to do in sport nutrition, like building muscle and losing fat. Right? We'll get to that in just a bit. First. Let's talk about the calories in relationship to their position in the fat loss, or sorry, in the body composition diet pyramid and performance, of course. Roughly 50% we've attributed in our analysis in this book to the total effect of how you run your diet is to calories. So what does that really mean? Well, 50% is a really, really big deal. And... That means a couple of things. First of all, it means one thing for sure. You can get your macros spot on. You can get your ratios wise. You can get your timing crystal clear. You can eat all the healthiest and most performance enhancing foods. You can take every supplement in the world and you can just monitor your hydration to perfection. And if you mess up your calories enough, you will go nowhere fast. For fat loss, you could go nowhere at all. For muscle gain, you could go nowhere at all just by messing up your calories. You could shoot yourself in the foot that much. 
Now, on the other hand, so that's point number one. So we cannot ignore calories. They're super important. If we get them really wrong, we're really hampering ourselves. The corollary to that implication, the other side of the coin, is that because calories are so powerful, they can make an effect with an otherwise really crappy diet can start to look maybe not so crappy, but in some fundamental way, effective to some degree. For example, the cabbage soup diet comes up every now and again. Uh, every 10 years or so, it's rediscovered by uh, lifestyle magazines. It's a diet in which you eat a whole lot of cabbage soup, which is, by most accounts, not very delicious. I don't know if you ever heard anyone say they just crave in cabbage soup, right? It's very rare. Uh, it's very filling. It has very few calories. You eat enough of it and your total daily calories start to get really low. And of course, the diet prescribes don't overeat other things. What you end up getting from this diet is that, you know, it's macros aren't great. It's timing is whatever. Um, it's food composition is interesting at best, certainly not optimal. So it fails on a lot of these main principles, but because it gives you a hypocaloric environment, an environment in which the calories you're taking in are insufficient compared to the calories you're burning, you will almost always lose weight. So people will say things like, well, I did the cabbage soup diet and it worked. Explain that with your fancy science. And that's actually quite easy to explain with fancy science because you generated a calorie deficit and calories are 50% of the effect. Like, hey, you're doing pretty well for yourself. Think about it this way. If you have a multiple choice test and you're guessing, completely guessing the answers, you know, you're going to get a 25% on that test usually if it's well made on average, 25% because you only guess a quarter of the time, right? For, for questions, uh, for answers to each question. But if you are doing the calorie balance approach and only hit calorie balance, you're scoring a 50% of that test. That, that's a way better than chance, right? So calorie balance is so powerful that a lot of diets that either really stink in every other regard or aren't that great in every other regard can be made to look like they function and indeed do function fundamentally well, especially for weight loss. Maybe not so much fat loss versus muscle gain. That's a bit more attention to the details there. And in, in fact, for weight gain, right? So let's keep that in mind. Calories should not be ignored if you want a big effect. And if they're set right, a lot of other things can be not so great. And the diet fundamentally still works pretty well. So definitely calories, number one for a reason, right? Now, the next question is, okay, if we can really twerk certain things and other things, can we get the calories just right so maybe we can lose fat without cutting calories? So let's be honest, cutting calories stinks because you get hungry, uh, you can't enjoy food with your friends as much, there has to be trade-offs, it's annoying. Can we lose fat without cutting calories? Um, yes, but it's going to be very inefficient and or require a huge energy output. So if you keep your calories identical, but you add like three hours of marathon running training per day to your plan, you lose weight like the world's coming to an end, but that's a hell of an investment. Or you could just cut like, you know, a thousand calories from your daily intake. And if you eat 3000 calories a day, that's not the end of the world. And you get the same unbelievable rates of weight loss, probably even too fast without doing a single bit more work. Now, of course, a real good calorie deficit should come from a combination of exercise, increasing expenditure, increasing activity of other kinds and decreasing intake. But we don't want to put ourselves in this position where we say we're not decreasing the intake at all. It's got to all come from expenditure. Because to lose meaningful amounts of weight, we got to do a whole lot more energy output. That's fatiguing, inconvenient, takes up a lot of time, so on and so forth. On the other hand, can you gain muscle without increasing calories at all? Well, remember, calories uh, determine your body weight almost exclusively. So if you want to gain weight, but you're not willing to increase your calories, for a while, you can inefficiently gain muscle as you lose some fat and gain some muscle over time. Once you become lean and for whatever that your genetics and other training variables and so on and so forth environment make that number, maybe let's say 10% fat, once you get to maybe around 10% fat if you're male, maybe 17% if you're female, for most people, body recomposition doesn't just occur after that point. Your body really doesn't like to lose fat and gain muscle at the same time once it's sufficiently lean. If you're considerably over fat, 30, 40, 50%, you can do that for a while. Still not ideal, but it works. Once you get lean enough, you know, there's just no way to add much muscle unless you're going to gain weight and you have to increase calories for that.
So our huge advice, right? Just, just to recap that last point, if you want to be jacked and you're uh, five foot, you know, five eleven and a half, weighing 135 pounds is just never going to get you jacked. It doesn't matter how lean you are, 135, 511 and a half. You're going to have to gain weight. The only way to do that is to increase calories. So at some point, gaining muscle without increasing calories is almost a contradiction in terms of the physical raw material you need to be huge is, you know, bringing calories in with. So our huge advice from RP and from all the research we've done is if you want to lose fat, give yourself the best power you can and manage your calories. Don't try to do it without, uh, without cutting food intake or without reducing your calories. Logically, intentionally, conservatively, but reduce your calories. If you're trying to gain weight, increase your calories. Again, with all the precautions, but don't slice out 50% of the pie for whatever reason doesn't make a whole lot of sense. These are super powerful ways to gain muscle, to gain weight, and to lose weight and lose fat. Now, we go back to just maintenance calories. You know, people say like, I have a fast metabolism. I need so many calories per day. What factors actually influence calorie demand? There's tons more data on this in the book, but a lot of the big ones are body size. Look, if you weigh 400 pounds, the amount of food it takes to just keep you at 400, rebuilding and maintaining those structures and keep you moving your giant 400 pound butt around, right? There's strong men that weigh 400 pounds that eat 8,000 calories a day just to stay the same size. So if you're really, really big, you're going to need a lot of calories. If you're really, really small, you're going to need way, way fewer, which let's refute, even though this isn't a myth chapter yet, let's refute the myth right out. Uh, the, what is it? The 2000 calorie diet that nutrition labels in the United States are based on. That's just pure nonsense. Some people are at 2000 calories for daily maintenance. Some people are just way bigger, way smaller, and there's just nowhere close to that. Another factor that's really big is activity level. Right? If you teach five yoga classes a day, you bike to and from work, and you have children that you're super physically active with, and also you personal train clients on the side, you're going to be burning thousands of calories a day just doing life. On the other hand, if you're an engineer or an architect and you spend a lot of time at a desk sitting down, making drawings, designs, you're just not burning a whole lot of calories. Maybe you take a, a you know, car to work and back or public transportation and you just don't have, you know, you might work out you know, once a day or something like that or three or four times a week. It just doesn't add up to the same activity level. So activity level, second to size usually in how much calories you demand. And a lot of that is what we basically call unplanned activity or non-exercise activity thermogenesis, which, which uh, acronym is NEAT. Isn't that NEAT? I'll wait for you guys to laugh at that one. So NEAT is basically not intentional exercise. People think, oh, I got to burn calories. I'm going to go to the treadmill and do 600, you know, calories on the treadmill. Just walking around and talking on the cell phone uh, with your friends burns calories. Doing housework. You guys have friends that can't ever really seem to sit still. They're always doing something. Those folks burn tons of calories. It doesn't have to be exercise. Just activity is a huge part of the way. There's tons of other factors you can look up in the book, but basically your maintenance calorie level is going to be really individually variable. It's up to you to find it and then work your diet from there. And the next question, sort of set that up, is, well, work your diet from there. How much extra calories should we add if we want to gain muscle? And how many calories do we cut if we want to lose fat? Well, generally speaking, if you're trying to gain muscle, gaining it anything more than about a pound a week is probably too ambitious and results in a disproportionate amount of fat gain right? And getting anything less than about a quarter pound a week, it's really hard to track and some weeks you might not even be gaining at all and it's like sort of needlessly slow, right? So uh, if we look at the calorie values that correspond roughly to those amounts, um, it's anywhere between, oh, about 150 to 500 uh, excess calories a day added into the diet to gain that weight over time. Now, a really big point, your calorie intake and your calorie set points change. You may burn more calories as you get bigger. You may become more active as you gain weight. <coughs> so you might need what you thought was 500 calories extra. Could already be wrong, but you might need more and more and more later. So basically, when you pick a calorie number and you give yourself 500 more, track your body weight to make sure you're gaining on schedule. And if you're not, eat more or eat less to reflect that. On the other hand, for fat loss, Generally speaking, we get to anywhere between half a percent and a percent of body weight per week. Um, 
is a really good uh, sort of boundary zone to lose a real good decent amount of fat, a good good rate of fat loss, but without you know getting too much fatigue, going too quickly, um, and losing too much muscle, and getting demotivated, getting too hungry, and quitting the diet. And if we go much slower, we kind of just going slow for no reason at all, and we end up getting more frustrated and have a tendency to burn out. So you know, for most people, 0.5 to 1% uh, of their weight loss per week is is something that's going to be between oh. 250 and 1,000 calories per day cut out of their diet or added through activity, usually some combination. Now, I know, hold on, freak out moment. Did I just say cut 1,000 calories a day? I must have lost my mind. Well, remember, we're covering a wide swath of individuals here, a lot of whom are heavyweight athletes. Somebody who weighs 350 pounds and competes in shot put, you know, they may eat a 6,000 calorie diet to maintain. For them, a 1,000 calorie cut man, that's not really a whole lot of food. That's down to 5,000. Oh no, ring the alarm bells. We're, we're starving here on 5,000 calories. So we're not saying for everyone cut 1,000 calories. That's incredible. That's insane. Somebody could be eating 1,250 calories a day for their maintenance. You don't cut 1,000 calories then, right? Then you cut 250. See how that works? So there's a range depending on your body weight and how quickly you want to lose and gain weight, right? Now, we just talked about calories. Can we just cut anything? Like when we say cut 1,000 calories or add 500, do we just add fats? Do we just add proteins? Do we just add carbs? Does it matter for results? It sure does. And we'll get into macros in the next chapter. I'll see you then.